birthday last month, or you've not participated all year long like David Butler has sometimes, you, this is your opportunity to catch up on that. So we'll start with birthdays. Any birthdays this month or the past? Anybody? Any birthdays? Mm. What an awesome thing. Also, for the first of the month, we do Jesus Kids. So, Miss Leslie, I'm going to ask you to have the Jesus Kids come on down this morning, and we'll do that. Good morning. Good morning, Delilah. Good morning, guys. We have been super busy at my house. We had to move Amelia's bedroom into our living room. And that's where all our clothes are, too. But guess what? When we did that, she started making her bed. And someone taught her, Kennedy taught her how to make her bed. So thank you, Kennedy. It looks fabulous again today. So that is going to be one of Amelia's new chores when we move into our new house. Now, does your parents ever ask you guys to do chores? Not me. Not you. Oh, you're lucky. I do. Do you do chores? Yeah. A lot of us have to do chores. You know what? Mommies and daddies have to do chores, too. Hey. Well, Do you know what? Sometimes you might get paid for your chores, right? And then you can buy cool stuff. Do you get paid for your chores, Blake? Yeah. You surprised her? That is awesome. You helped your mom a lot. And you know what? To say thank you, your mom gave you an allowance. Pretty cool, huh? All right, guys. You know what? Can I share now? I have a story to share with you. Can I do that? Delilah, you can tell me. I want to read you guys a story this morning. It's about a dad and his two sons, and their names are John and William. One day, dad walked into John's room to find him building Legos. John, there are leaves scattered all over the yard. Would you please rake the leaves and put them in this trash bag? Can you hold it for me, Cam? Thank you, buddy. Oh, dad. I don't have time to rake the leaves. I'm building with my Legos. I really want to finish it today, John answered. The dad turned and left the room and went to look for William. He found William playing video games. 
asked. William, there are a lot of leaves in the yard. Would you please rake these leaves and put them in the... Dad asked. Sure, I'd be glad to, William answered. Great, said Dad. I'll leave the rake and the trash bags in the yard. After his father left, John began to think about what he had asked him to do. <coughs> I can rake the leaves and still have plenty of time to finish my Legos later, John thought to himself. He went outside and began raking leaves. When Dad came back home, he saw John raking leaves. Where is William? Dad asked. I don't know. The last time I saw him, he was playing video games, John replied. When Dad went into the house, guess what he saw? There sat William, still playing video games. Now, think about this. Which two of those sons pleased his father? John said he wouldn't rake the leaves, but he did. Or William, who said he would rake the leaves, but didn't. Connor? John. John, good job, guys. Now, Jesus told a story similar to this in a parable, and it's in Matthew 21, <laughs> verses 28 and 32. And he told this parable to show how different people obey what God has called them to do. In Jesus' parable, there were two sons, and the father asked both sons to go and work in his vineyard. Just as the boys in the story I just read, one son answered no, but he did go and work. The other answered yes, but he did not go and do the work. In telling the story, Jesus wants us to realize that what we do is more important than what we say we will do. Jesus wants us to answer, yes, Blake, when he tells us to love one another. But what he really wants is for us to show that we love one another. Jesus wants us to answer, yes, when he says, follow me. But what he really wants, Delilah, is for us to follow Jesus and to listen and obey him. Now, guys, you know what? That's the kind of child I want to be. I want to be the one that does what God asks. I need everybody to close your eyes and bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, sometimes we say yes, but our actions say no. Help us to be faithful to do what you have called us to do. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Black Oak Baptist Church. Kids are making their way out the back door back there. I'm going to ask our praise team to come up, and we're going to worship this morning. First of the month, we do a new song. This is a new song. You better get used to it, because we're going to do it all month long, a little praise and worship in the house of the Lord this morning. Right? So stand up with us this morning. Follow along on the screen. Everybody give a shout out to the Lord this morning. Follow along with us. Every nation and tongue from Jericho. 
and uh, I'm grateful to be a part of the family of God and uh, why he would choose sinners like us to bring us into his family I'll never understand that I, I've tried to understand it tried to comprehend it but I, I, I just can't but thank God he did thank God he loved us enough to send his son to die to allow us to be a part of his forever family and I'm grateful for that we want to welcome you this morning all of our guests we're honored to have you tickled to death that you're here and you've chosen to join in worship with us this morning and uh, we want you to do that we want you just to worship the Lord if you need to pray at any time during the service we say this all the time but I say it again uh, you don't have to wait to the end of the invitation to come you come when the Holy Spirit draws you to come and pray uh, it'll be in order so you do that this morning uh, also we'd like you to fill out the connect card right inside your bulletins if you'll just tear that off uh, and then give it to our, your greeters as you leave out this morning they'll be back there as you leave hand that to them for our church members you need to change information update information you can do that as well here in just a moment we're going to take up the offer and let me say this this past week I was with uh, several other pastors Christina and I were with their wives and and we just sat down and talked we began to just talk about the ministry talked about church and uh, I, I left there this week really just feeling blessed uh, God has been moving in our church and and uh, and I'm grateful for that and, and I hear some of these preachers say well we uh, we don't have enough money to pay our staff we're having to cut back services we don't have enough money to keep the lights on and, and I would ask some questions well why is that and and some of them they're they run double what we do and uh, they said well preacher our people if they just don't like what's going on in church they don't give and I said well that ain't that ain't right uh, you give not because you like what's going on you give because God tells you to give Amen. and uh, and so uh, I left there really grateful for the faithfulness of our church not only in giving but also in just doing the work of God and uh, and I just want to say how much I appreciate you so at this time I'm going to ask our ushers begin to make their way down and as they're doing that I want you to turn to a few people around you shake their hands and tell them good morning follow along with sing. Majesty, worship His majesty, unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, King of authority. Brother Curtis Isabel leads us in a word of prayer, but before he does, I'm going to ask Brother David Butler if he'll come and light our candles. Last Sunday uh, kicked off the Gold Star Mothers Month, and if you don't know what Gold Star Mothers is, any mother or father that's lost a child in battle, uh, they have a designation as a Gold Star that they can apply for, and it just it honors them. So remember all the Gold Star Mothers throughout the rest of the year. Brother Curtis, you come and lead us in a word of prayer before we take up our offer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this time in your house to, to worship you, Lord. Just thank you for that opportunity. Thank you uh, for the men and women of our military, Lord, and uh, that, that protect us and, and keep us safe and, and fight for our freedoms every day. And just thank you so much for them and their families and, and, and uh, the risks that they go through and, and uh, the dangers that they face. Lord, just ask that you protect them and let, let their families know how much we understand what they go through and, and are thinking about
about them and praying for them as well. Um, just ask you to be with our service here today and prepare our hearts and minds for the message you've given Brother Lee to give us, Lord, and, and um, just, just protect us and watch over us as, as we come back here tonight as well. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Have my Sure. 
Amen. Thank God for His unfailing love this morning. I invite you to be turning in your Bibles today to the book of 1 John. That's back towards the book of Revelation. Uh, the book of 1 John chapter 1. This morning we're beginning a journey through what we call the epistles of John uh, in a series I've entitled All in the Family. Uh, through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, John begins to describe what it means to be a part of the family of God. He deals with the question on what it means to be a part and what does it mean to be a part of the family of God. And so we're going to look uh, over the next several weeks at these epistles. We're going to walk through 1st John together, then we're going to walk through 2nd John, and then finally we're going to walk through 3rd John. And uh, so we invite you just to be reading ahead uh, as we walk uh, through these uh, books and through these chapters. I believe it will bless your heart. Uh, it's blessed mine as I have studied it. John really knew what it was a part, to, what it meant to be a part of the family of God. He loved Jesus, we know, whenever he had his earthly ministry. He called out the 12 disciples. And in that 12 disciples, there was a core group of men uh, three of them that, uh, by, that we call the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And that inner circle really knew what it meant to be a part of the family of God. They, they heard from Jesus more than the others did, uh, not because he loved them anymore, but just, just that's what he chose, all of us. We have a group of acquaintances that we have here, and then uh, you have your family, and then you may have your close friends and things like that, and it's the same way in Jesus' life. But when it comes to John, we know John was just a little bit more closer to Jesus than even Peter and James were. And we know that because Jesus even calls John the beloved, the beloved disciple, the one who uh, Jesus loved. And, uh, and so we're going to get into that and see what he says. He wrote five books. We know that in the Word of God. He wrote the Gospel of John. Uh, he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And we also know he wrote... Revelation. So let's begin to look now. First John chapter number 1. We'll begin in the first four verses and see uh, what he says. I want to preach to us on the subject this morning. I know it's real. Uh, what is real? Well, I, I know that Jesus is real. I know heaven is real. I know the love of God is real. And John begins to describe all these things in his introduction. Uh, of this book. So stand with me, would you please, as we read these first four verses out of 1 John chapter number 1, beginning in verse 1. Here's what he says That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Do you notice what he did just then? He used three senses to describe. Who Jesus, how he knew Jesus was real. He said, I've heard him with my ears, I've seen him with my eyes, and I've handled him with my hands. Verse 2, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and shew unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Verse 3, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father. And with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning as we get into the Word of God, that you speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that our hearts will be drawn closer to you. Lord, that we understand that it is truly real. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You could be seated. Why would John write these three letters? Uh, why would he write this first epistle of John and then later he would write the second epistle and then lastly he'd write the little third epistle of John? Why would he do that? Well, there's four reasons he gives us through the books why he would. One reason he wrote these books was uh, to provide assurance unto salvation. He wanted you to know uh, to th that you know that you know that you know that you've been born again. John wanted to make sure that his readers would understand what it means to be born again, to know the love of God. And he said, I write these letters to you that you may know that you have eternal life. So that leads me to a question for you this morning. Do you know that you have eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you ever felt the love of God sweep over your soul and enter into your heart and know what it means to be called a child of God? 
This past week, while we were gone, we had an evening with Tommy Bowden. Some of you may know who Tommy is. He's a, uh, the former coach of Clemson, the head coach of Clemson. He pastored some other colleges as well. But we spent some time with him and his wife this week. And, uh, and while spending time with him, his wife told us a story. He said uh, Tommy was uh, getting ready to leave on another recruiting trip. And uh, she was just very depressed over it. said, uh, you know, he's gone all the time, coaching all the time, recruiting all the time. And, and just this one particular night, she said, it just got to me. And, and she said, Tommy, she said, uh, would you sit down on the bed for a moment? And he sat down. And, and uh, she said, Tommy, I, I just want you to know how I feel. She said, I really feel like you love football more than you do me. And here's what he said. He said, yeah, but I love you more than I do basketball. The great news from the Word of God is simply this. God loves everybody. And He loves you so much that He would be willing to send His own darling Son to die on a cross. And by the way, I'm just one to believe, uh, like we used to sing years ago, red, yellow, black, or white, we're all pressed in His side. Anybody who understands that they're lost and needs Jesus to save them can be saved. Now we got a doctrine floating around now that says God picks and chooses and uh, it's kind of like when you was a, a kid and, and you got a little daisy or something and he loves me, he don't love me, he loves me, he don't love me. And, and, and finally you get that last one hoping that he loves you. Well, I got good news for you this morning. According to the Word of God, he loves you this morning. So much so he's willing that anybody will come and be born again. John chapter 10, or Romans chapter 10 says, Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that means anyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever anybody uh, that believes on him shall have eternal life so John writes these books that we may know that we're saved that we he, he can provide assurance of salvation another reason he wrote these books was to protect the saints in John's day like in today's day people will try to lead you astray and John writes to protect you to know that you know that what you believe in uh, and understand what thus said the Word of God. A third reason he wrote these books was to prevent sin. He wanted to make sure that sin stayed out of our lives. First John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. He wanted to make sure that we uh, tried to stay as far away from sin as we can. The last reason he wrote these books was to promote joy. He wanted joy to come out of our lives as Christians. We just read... Uh, verse 4 of chapter 1, he said, These things I write unto you that your joy may be full. Let me ask you something, dear saints of God, this morning. Are, do you have joy in your Christian life? Uh, do you walk in the peace of God? Do you have joy in your heart? It seems to me that we live in a time that some people have just enough religion to make them miserable. Uh, it's kind of like a headache. Uh, you, you, you don't like headaches and you can't stand them, but you can't get rid of your head. And that's how a lot of people treat their Christian life. Uh, they've just got enough religion to make them miserable. And, and, and them being miserable, uh, in turn, they make other people miserable around them. But dear friend, John says your joy can be full. You don't have to uh, just get through life. You don't have to just get down the road and try to make it another day. Friend, you can enjoy the journey. Uh, so now as we begin to look at these first four verses of chapter 1, we will see that John many times through these books, he'll refer to Jesus as the word of life as he did in verse number 1. He said, we have heard, we've seen, and we've handled the word of life. Now that's very interesting to me that he would tag this title onto Jesus. Uh, one, because we know words help us to communicate. And what John was saying when he called Jesus the word of life, he's saying Jesus is how God communicates to us. Uh, you see, Jesus is the noun of God. Jesus is the verb of God. Jesus is the adjective of God. Uh, Jesus is God's way of spelling himself out to us that we may know how much he really does love us. So let's see some truths of John telling us some things about Jesus. Number one, he shows us the Christ of reality. Let's look in verse 1 again. That which was from the beginning 
which we have heard and we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. You see, in John's day, they had Gnostics, and these Gnostics were coming into the church, and uh, they were teaching things that was against the Word of God. They taught that Jesus was not who everyone thought He was. They denied His humanity. They said, no way that this Jesus is God, uh, nor did He come from God, because there's no way that God and humanity can combine. And so they were teaching that uh, Jesus was not the Son of God. So John, right out of the gate, as he writes to the church, Right out of the gate, he says, this Jesus I'm talking about is real. He actually existed. Uh, I've seen him. I've heard him. I've touched him. By the way, let me tell you something this morning. Let me tell you all doubters. This past week, I posted something on my Twitter feed, and I had over 20 atheists respond to it. And I mean, just wire me out and, and cussing at me and all these things. Let me tell you, if you're here and you're thinking, well, I'm not sure about this Jesus, let me tell you, he is real this morning. You can deny him all you want to. Uh, you can say he's not who he says he is all you want to. Uh, all these sissy liberal preachers out here uh, saying he's not everything he said he is. I'm telling you, he's the Son of God. He's the Lamb of God. He's the Christ that came to this earth that we may know God and the love of God. Preach, Lee, preach. I'm getting excited. Uh, he is the Christ of reality this morning. He is God. He actually existed. He was here. He was. He talked, he talked, he taught people, he preached to people, he prayed to the Father. And then before he left out of here, he went to a cross, he bled, suffered, and died that we may know him. And then he got up out of the grave and he went back to the Father. He's real this morning. Hallelujah. I bless myself. He's the Christ of reality. You see, Jesus, he tells us, was real eternally. He said, that which was from the beginning. He, he was there when it all started. Just roll back the pages of the Word of God. Roll back the pages of time and go all the way back to the beginning. And John says he was there in the beginning. Preacher, do you really believe Jesus was there in creation? I sure do. You remember God is creating all these things and He's speaking light and He's speaking uh, the earth and He's speaking the galaxies into existence. And then finally, God decides to inhabit earth with something that we call man, humans. And here's what God said. God said, let us make man in our own image. Now, if God was the only one there, then why would He say let us? us. Jesus was there in the beginning. Now, now, I want you to realize something. There's three main beginnings in the Word of God. Genesis 1-1, we find the beginning of creation. God begins to create. The second beginning is in Mark chapter 1 verse 1, and he talks about the beginning of the gospel. The gospel begins to come out. Jesus, the Lamb of God, died. And then the third main beginning in the Bible is found right here in 1 John 1, 1 when, Jesus say, when John says Jesus has been around since creation. You see, the truth is Jesus is God. God is Jesus. Jesus said in John 12, 45, He that seeth me has seen him who hath sent me. Jesus said we are one. Hebrews 13 and 8, Christ, the, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm telling you, Jesus has always been. For all eternity, Jesus has been. He, he was there before the world uh, was created. He was there before time came into existence. He was there before the sun rotated around the world. He was there before the moon began to shine in the night sky. He was there before the stars were spoken into existence. By the way, the Bible says he counts the stars and calls them by name. He knows how many grains of sand is on the seashore. And, and just... So you know, he knows how many hairs are on your head. And if you don't have any, he knows that too. I believe he even knows how many hairs is in your toupee. I mean, he knows everything. He's the Christ of eternity. He's been around ever since the beginning. And by the way, if you were there at the beginning, then you have to know it all. Because you've seen it develop. Uh, and go all throughout time. So he knows everything. Solomon would say this. He said, there's nothing new under the sun. 
that God hasn't created. Everything is from Him. Uh, now things have, 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 have come about and think birds have uh, brought on more different types of birds and animals, different types of animals that they breed with each other. But still, God knows everything that happens. By the way, the Bible says the sun wouldn't rise up unless he commanded it to. He causes the dew to come down in the morning. He's the God of eternity. He, he was real, and he's been real uh, eternally. But then in verse 2, John says Jesus is real historically. Look at what he said. For, for the life was manifested that we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life. I, I, I like that word to use that. I actually underlined it in my Bible. He, he said, we have shown, we, we show unto you that eternal life. What is that eternal life? Jesus, he is eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Now that word manifested means to be made visible, to show something that was not uh, been able to be seen before. So, so what he's saying is the eternal, invisible Christ was born, and he became visible. The God that we could not touch became touchable. Uh, it, it, you remember uh, one of my favorite stories in the Word of God, Mark chapter number 5. There's that old uh, lady. She's had a blood issue for 12 long years. The Bible says, Luke said that he, she had went to every doctor, spent all that she had, but she rather grew worse. Now, wouldn't that be a bad deal? You're sick. This blood issue they tell us she had was basically she was bleeding from every orifice of her body. Some, some scholars even believe her eyes would, would, would twic, trickle out blood. She would spit blood out of her mouth. It was coming out of her nose. Uh, she had a blood disorder. And she went to every doctor. She drained her bank account. She, she did all of these things, and she still grew worse. The Bible even goes on to say in the book of Luke that she spent all that she had. She drained the 401K. She drained the savings account. She drained all these things. She still grew, up, grew worse, and now she didn't have a dime to her name. But then all of a sudden, she hears about a man named Jesus. Who is this guy? Well... Uh, lady, I want you to know he was in a town, a couple of towns over uh, a few days ago and he called a, he calls a deaf man to start hearing again. Really? Yeah. And hey, this, this, this guy I've heard he's raised some folks from the dead even. He's called lame people to walk. He calls, he's called the dumb to talk and the blind eyes to open. Here's what she said in Mark chapter 5. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. I don't have to touch him I don't have to hug him. I don't have to kiss him. If I could just touch his garment, I know that I'll be made whole. The Bible says he, she went. She had pressed through the crowd. By the way, she wasn't supposed to do that. She was considered unclean. She was supposed to stay to herself. But she said, hey, I know I'm unclean, but i got to get to Jesus. By the way, let me tell you something this morning. The world will tell you you're nothing. They'll tell you you're nobody. But Jesus says, come to me and I'll make you a somebody. She had pressed through the crowd. She touched just the hem, the bottom part of his garment. And the Bible says immediately, not three days later after she's taken her medicine, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. It can quit. It quit. You know, Jews even still today don't believe that Christ was the Son of God. They're still looking for Jesus to come. They believe that Jesus, will come, when he comes, he'll set up his kingdom. And they believe that Jesus was a great teacher and a great scholar. Uh, but they were looking for the Messiah to come and set up a, a kingdom. And Jesus come born in a manger. So they have a hard time coming to grips with that. But a testimony of a Jewish woman heard, she went to a Christian church one day and heard the story of that woman with the issue of blood. How she reached out and touched the hem of his garment. During an invitation, that Jewish woman came down and gave her heart to Christ. She got up and she said, I finally realized that Jesus is the Messiah we've been longing for for years. The preacher said, why is that? She said, because if you go back to the Old Testament, which is what the Jew, Jewish people look at and they study, the Bible says that he will come with healing in his wings. She said if you, touch, if you translate that uh, phrase, healing in his wings, it literally means he'll come with healing in his garments. She said, whenever I heard about that woman, 
that touched his garment and she was made whole, I knew right then he was the man I've been looking for. By the way, when you touch Jesus by faith, you'll find out he's what you've been looking for. He's what you've been looking for. John 1 and 1, 1 and 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He's the, the Christ uh, historically. Uh, story goes when Abraham Lincoln was born, the day he was born and the town he was born, uh, story goes that there was two people who lived in that little city where he was born and they were meeting for breakfast one morning. The first uh, man asked the other, said, well, has anything happened today? And, and the other guy said, no. He said, uh, you know, nothing ever happens in this town. He said, Tom Lincoln had a son born today, but you know, he'll not turn out to be anything. Nothing ever happens in this town. Back some 2,000 years ago in a little town called Bethlehem, the world has overlooked it, but I'm telling you, something major happened that day. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It, it was so great and such a great happening that the angels would come down and tell some shepherd boys outside of town, said, hey, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He's the Jesus historian. And notice, again, John uses those three senses to explain his point. In verse 1, he said, we've heard him. He, he, he was that disciple that uh, was around Jesus more than probably any of the rest of them. And he said, I've heard him. That word heard is a verb uh, in the original text, and it's, it's an action verb. That means it, it happened in times past, but it still continues to this day. So when he says, uh, I, we have heard him, what John's saying is, I've heard him before, but his words are still ringing in my ears. I still hear him. And then the second sense he uses is, verse 1, he said, we've seen him. Now this is what really uh, makes the New Testament what it is, and uh, it authenticates what it says, that people actually seen Jesus. Well, preacher, maybe they were hallucinating. I've heard that argument before. Maybe he wasn't real. Uh, these 12 may have taken something, and they hallucinated uh, to think they saw him. Well, verse 1 also says, we have looked upon him. Now, you take that word look, and it's where we get our English word theater. It means more than a glimpse. We've just not uh, hallucinated and he was gone, but we have gazed on him. We, we, we've not just watched a short 30-second commercial. We've sat down in the movie theater and we've watched him over and over and over again. John said, we have really seen the Lord. Then in verse 1 again, he said, we've handled him. We have touched him. I've heard him with my ears. I've saw him with my eyes. I've touched him with my hands. Jesus is real. Then John moves from the physical nearness to the spiritual nearness. Dear friend, I want you to know something this morning. You can know Jesus by faith. You can come to him and be born again. You see, faith is the hands, it's the eyes, and the ears of the soul. We have never seen Jesus physically, but I've seen him by faith. I've never heard Jesus with my physical ears, but I've heard him by faith. I've never reached out and touched him physically, but I have by faith. You, you, can't, you, you cannot just know about Jesus, but you can know him personally this morning. I know about a lot of people. I know about President Donald Trump, but I don't know him. I know about Pope, the, the Pope for the Catholic Church. I've heard about him, read about him, but I don't know him. Dear friend, but I can tell you this, I've met the King of Glory. And I know him, and i got even better news than that. He knows me. And he knows you. And he can know you as part of the family of God if you just come to him this morning. We're talking about a real Jesus. But then secondly, he tells us about the Christ of relationship so so he moves and says hey this Jesus is real we know he's real but now he moves into verse 3 and he tells us about uh, a relationship with Christ that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you 
that ye also have fellowship with us. And, and, and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That word fellowship means to have in common, uh, to, to have something in common. Now, we hear the word fellowship all the time, and when we hear it, the first thing that comes to our brains is walking around and shaking hands with people in the church, but that's not what the Bible is speaking of. Uh, to, to, to come into fellowship means you have things in common. To be in fellowship with Jesus means that he lives in your heart and he rules in your life. And John lays out a twofold fellowship here in this verse 3. First of all, the first family we, or the first fellowship we have is with the family. Notice what he said, that we may also, uh, that ye may also have fellowship with us. John says, I want us to have fellowship together. Uh, a, a horizontal fellowship. We, uh, our fellowship with one another, men and women, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now we have a teaching in our churches that's just developed over the years. It says that we all are brothers and sisters, and God is our Father, and He's the Father of everybody. But I want to tell you something this morning. That's a lie. We're not all brothers and sisters. God is not the father of everybody. Some folks have never been saved. And some folks, the Bible tells us there's two families. There's the family of the devil and there's the family of God. The question is, whose family are you in? The question is, who do you have fellowship with this morning? The only way to get into God's family is to be born again. Not baptized, and baptism is a good thing. Not to have your name on a church roll, and that's a good thing. But you must be born again. And once you're saved, then you become a part of the family of God. And you will desire to be around the family of God. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, after the Holy Spirit has come, people are getting saved right and left in the early church. The Bible says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayer. We have fellowship with the family of God. If you're truly saved this morning, you enjoy being around the family of God. You love hearing from the Word of God. You love partaking in the things of God. You love witnessing for Jesus. You know you're a part of the family when you enjoy one another's fellowship. The Bible says this in Ephesians 5, talking about marriage between a man and a woman. The Bible says that uh, the husband ought to love his wife as what? As Christ loved the church. And if you're a Christian, if you're Christ-like, then guess what you'll love? You'll love what Jesus loved. What does he love? He loves the church. You'll be a part of it. And so there's a relationship horizontally he begins with, and that's with the family. But then there's a relationship vertically he talks about, and that's with the Father. Again, in verse number 3, he said, Truly, I love this, and truly our fellowship is with the Father. Now, isn't that amazing? Isn't the grace of God something amazing? Here we are, a sin-cursed world made after Adam, and God says, I want fellowship with you. A holy, sinless God who sits on the throne of the universe looks at a world that's full of sin and turmoil, a life that deserves hell, and says, I desire fellowship with you. That's grace. That is the grace of of God. Preacher, how do I have fellowship with God? Well, I've said it seemed like a lot here recently, but maybe it, God's just trying to drive it home with somebody. You have fellowship with God in two ways, Bible study and prayer. In Bible study, God talks to you. In prayer, you talk to God. So how's your fellowship with the Father? The Christ we preach is the Christ of relationship. He wants us to have a relationship with one another. He wants us to have a relationship with him. Number three, we see the Christ of rejoicing. Look what he said in verse four. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. I looked up that word full to try to get what it means. And you know what I find out very interesting. You know what that word full means? It means to be full. It means to be filled to the brim. It means to be absolutely full. God says, in your Christian life, 
your joy can be full. You don't have to run around with a joy tank that's half full or a joy tank that's just a quarter away full. Your joy can be absolutely filled up. You see, that the lost world, they have happiness. The, the, world, the lost world, uh, they may even uh, find some kind of uh, joy, I guess you want to call it, but they, they don't have the joy of the Lord. It's interesting to me. We live in a time we have more movies now. We have more entertainment now. We have more attractions now. But we are more lonely and worried now than ever before in history. Sure are. I mean, you can go to the movies and spend every last dime you have and still be miserable. You, you, you can go to attractions. You, you can go to Dollywood. You can go to and have a good time and be happy. But you get out of Dollywood, you get back in the car, and you realize your problems are still there. The happiness is gone. But dear friend, the Lord doesn't talk to us about happiness this morning. He talks about joy. Joy even in the hard times. Joy even in the good times. Joy even in the in-between times. And John says, I write these things unto you because the Spirit of God has told me that God wants your joy tank So let me ask you a question. How full is your joy tank? Well, preacher, you just don't understand what's going on. I'm not asking about your circumstances. Your circumstances determine your happiness, but your joy can be full. Uh, Psalm 16, 11 says, In thy presence is fullness of joy. You want to have a, joy, a full joy tank? Get in the presence of Jesus. In thy presence, Psalm 16, 11, In thy presence is the fullness of joy. I want you to hear me. You'll not find joy at J.C. Penney. You'll not find joy at the Walmart. You won't find joy at Belk. You won't find joy at the liquor store. You won't find joy at the mall. You won't find joy on television. But I'll tell you where you can find it. In Jesus. I heard a story this past week. I, I, I didn't even know uh, it ever happened. Uh, J.C. Penney, Mr. J.C. Penney, the guy that founded J.C. Penney, was a millionaire. I mean, he, he had all the money in the world. Stock market went down several years ago. He became depressed, clinically depressed, discouraged. He ended up in an insane asylum. Insane asylum. He, he went half crazy because he about lost everything. One day, Mr. J.C. Penney was walking down the hallway, passing the chapel. And he heard coming from inside the chapel there in the St. Asylum an old song, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. And by his own testimony there in that hallway, he gave his heart and life to Jesus. He said, Jesus, I've tried, but I'm tired of trying. I, I, I've fought, but I'm tired of fighting. And I want to give my heart and life to you. He got saved. He got better, came out of the insane asylum, went back to work and built the organization up bigger than it ever had been before. Preacher, you saying if I give my heart to Jesus, I'll have millions of dollars? No, but I tell you, joy be full. I tell you, you'll not need for nothing. David said, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never, no, never, no, never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging for bread. You may not have everything you want, but I'll tell you, you have all you need. Your joy tank will be full. You see, we get our joy from several places as Christians. First of all, I get my joy from salvation. In fact, I'm saved. Hey, if Jesus doesn't bless me again in all my born days, brother, I'm saved and on my way to heaven. That's enough to have joy over. Hey, I, I'm going to be leaving uh, streets that have potholes in them, and I'm going to be walking down the street of gold one of these days. That puts joy in my heart. Old Dr. Adrian Rogers said, one day I'll be kicking up gold dust. Uh, amen to that. I get joy. In my salvation. Isaiah 12, verse 3 says, Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. 
Friend, when you realize Jesus is your Savior and heaven is your home, it'll fill your joy tank up. Billy Bray is, he would offend a lot of Christians today, and, uh, but he wasn't quiet about his joy. He, he went all the time, praise the Lord, hallelujah, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. You get him in a church service, they'd start singing Amazing Grace. He'd stand up, praise the Lord, I know about that grace you're singing about. He just wasn't quiet about it. One day somebody asked old Billy Bray, they said, uh, what about if you died and find out that you had to go to hell? What about if you find out one day that, that when you die and you stand for God that you have to go to hell? Here was Billy's response. He said, well, if that's the case, then as good as Jesus has been to me and as real as he's been to me and the wonder that I have and how precious he's been to me, then I guess when I'd get to hell, I'd just run up and down the streets of hell uh, hollering, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! He said, I'd holler up and down the streets of hell, Praise the Lord! He's been good to me. He said, I'd holler and holler until it gets to the point the devil looks at me and says, Billy Bray, we can't have that down here. You've got to go back to heaven. <laughs> I'm telling you, he'll fill your joy tank up. Even when it feels like your life is going through the pits of hell, he'll fill your joy tank. Oh, praise the Lord. I don't have it good now, but he's been good to me, and that's enough to thank him for. I told you the story a long time ago, but it's worth repeating about the, the, the lady. Every morning she had come out on her porch after her morning devotion time with God. And by the way, you need that. You need a time uh, sometime during your day to just stop from the hecticness of life and focus on Jesus and Him only. She'd come out after uh, her devotion time every morning. She'd come out on the porch. She'd holler, Praise the Lord! He's been good to me. Well, an atheist moved in next door, and he didn't like that. One morning, she walked out, and she said, Praise the Lord! He's been good to me. I don't have much money right now, and I don't have much food, but Lord, you've been good to me, and I want to praise your sweet name. That atheist thought, Ah, I'm going to show her God's not real. I'm going to show her that uh, she's worshiping uh, some kind of uh, uh, imagination in her brain. So he went to the grocery store that night and got a box full of food, and put it on her porch. Next morning she walked out after a devotion time, and there was that box full of food. And she said, Well, praise the Lord. The Lord has provided for my needs. About that time that atheist popped out from the bushes. He said, Aha, I got you. He said, The Lord didn't provide that. I did. She looked back up to heaven. She said, praise the Lord. The devil provided for my needs. Or, or, the Lord's provided for my needs. And he made the devil pay for it. <laughs> I like it when the devil's got to pay for stuff every now and then. I'm telling you, your joy can be full this morning. Christian, you're discouraged, and I understand. Hey, I've been in the valley of discouragement many times in my life. But I'm telling you, even in discouragement, you can look up and realize your God's still on the throne and have some joy in your life. John said, I'm writing these things that your joy may be full. Let me ask you something. Is Jesus real to you? Is he as real to you as he was the day that you gave your heart and life to him? Remember who your Savior is. Remember where he's taking you. He'll put joy in your heart. i tell you another place we get joy, and that's from the Scriptures in the Word of God. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. You know what he's saying? The Bible's like a good meal to me. The Bible's like a good meal. I'm telling you, if you would dedicate to read the Word of God, maybe just one chapter of the New Testament a day for 260 days, uh, you'll realize uh, that you have more joy than you've ever known in your life. Christians get joy out of their salvation. They get joy out of the Scripture. I tell you someplace else I get joy from, soul winning. I love seeing people born again. I don't want to be the only one thrown down the streets of heaven. I want to take a few people with me. I'd hate to get to heaven and find out that I brought no one with me to heaven. That I was by myself. I want to take as many people as I can. Heard a story one time of a, uh, a boy. He lived in the projects in the town and and a missionary decided to uh, found a, a um, restaurant there in, right in the heart uh, of that uh, projects where that little boy lived at. 
one evening that little boy wanting to see what was going on uh, over there at that new building, he walked up and he put his face against the window and he saw people in there eating. And, oh, the meal looked great. Hot food and, and beverages. And he thought, oh, that'd be great to be able to go in there and get something to eat. And the owner, the missionary, he, he, he saw the little boy and he walked outside and the man said, uh, son, why don't you come on in here and get you something to eat? Why don't, why don't you come on in here and sit down? That little boy began to cry. And the missionary said, what are you crying for? It's free. It won't cost you a dime. The little boy kept crying. The man said, what, what's wrong, son? He said, mister, he said, this meal looks so good. He said, but I've got a buddy across the street who's hungry too. And I can't be happy till he's eating what I'm eating. Dear Christian, you'll never be happy till you get people to start eating what you're eating. And that's the joy of Jesus. The grace of Almighty God. One man, he won a ticket to go on a cruise one time. And the man didn't have much money to his name and he thought, man, I'm going to go on this cruise, this four-night cruise, but I can't afford anything to eat. I, I, I can't afford any of that stuff. So the old man packed in four days worth of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. About the second day into the cruise, he's seen all these people walk by with their salads and their steaks and their shrimps and their lobsters, and he thought, oh... I would love to have some of that food. Finally, one of the, the, the one of the board the ship members come by and said said uh, he, he asked him said ma'am let me ask you a question he said how much would it cost me to get just a salad off that salad bar and that woman kind of stickered and said what are you talking about he said I, I just want to know how much would it be he said I've been eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches now for two days every meal. And I just wondered how much would it be for me to get a salad off that salad bar. She said, sir, she said, when you got your ticket, you got everything on board. How about it? I'm afraid today we've got too many saints of God. Listen, beloved, I, I, I'm afraid we've got too many saints of God that's eating the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches of the world when God's prepared you a feast of joy. have at it every head bowed every eye closed this morning the feast has been prepared and the Lord says come and die have at it come and get all you want you don't have to live life just trying to make it through come to the buffet par of the Lord called joy and dine with him. He is the Christ of reality. He's real. Is he real in your life? Maybe I'm speaking to you this morning and you're lost. You've never been saved. You've never been born again. You say, preacher, I want him to be real in my life. I, I want to I want to ask Jesus into my heart. I want to be saved this morning. I, I want a real, genuine relationship with Almighty God. If that's you, then in just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. I'm going to begin to ask you to come. Come. And ask Jesus to come into your heart. Let him become real in your life. Preacher, how do I do that? Well, the Bible says if you, well, first of all, uh, believe that he died on the cross. God raised him from the dead. Confess him with your mouth. You'll be saved. So here's all you got to do. First of all, you got to believe he died for you. You got to believe he rose from the dead. And then you've got to come and ask Him to be your Savior. Lord, I believe you died for me. I realize I'm a sinner. Without you, hell would be my home. And I want to go to heaven when I die. I don't want to die lost. I don't want to die unsaved. I want to die saved. Take me to heaven. Become my Savior today. And the Bible says anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you be saved today? Would you allow Christ to become real in your life? He's not only the Christ of reality, He's the Christ of relationships. 
Maybe this morning there's a torn relationship between you and somebody else. Maybe they're in this building. Maybe they're not. Maybe it's a friendship or a family member. And you need to come and pray about that relationship this morning. Maybe there is somebody in this place that you need to go to and take them by the hand and tell them you're sorry. Or maybe there's somebody here that's already said they're sorry, but you need to tell them, I forgive you. True born-again Christians will never live a life that there's alts or grudges against others. If you've truly been saved, you'll live a life of unity, a life of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus would say. Maybe you need to take care of a relationship horizontally, but maybe you need to take care of this morning, Christians, with your relationship vertically. Maybe there's some things between you and God that you need to take care of this morning. He's the God of reality. Make Him real. He's the God of relationships. Take care of your relationship with others. Take care of your relationship with God. He's the God of rejoicing. Your joy tank can be full this morning. Have at it. Come and eat. Come and fill up. The Lord wants to help you and the Lord wants to take care of you. The Lord wants to give you peace that passes all understanding. He wants to give you love that the world and your friends and family can't offer but you must come to him lost people would you come and be saved Christians would you come and take care of things between you and God maybe you're here and you need to join the church if that's the case we want to invite you just come forward talk to one of these guys standing down here they'll help you maybe you need to come be baptized you've been saved but you've never been baptized say hey I'm going to be baptized why don't you come and say, hey, count me in. Put me down. I want to be baptized. I want to follow the Lord. Just like Jesus got baptized, I want to get baptized. Whatever the need is this morning, the Holy Spirit of God beckons. Come and die. You don't have to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches any longer. Come to the feast called joy. The feast called grace. The feast called love. Have at it. It's here you come. Father, we pray now as we've come to the invitation time, Lord, you're speaking to our hearts. You've shown us things we need to take care of this morning. And Father, I pray in your powerful, sweet name that we just come and feast from the table of joy that you've so lovingly and graciously prepared. Lord, as you call us, we come right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's.